we, did, we ended up calling them Mama Angie and Daddy Mike, and we hoped for that long-term relationship. And I did, for a couple years, I was visiting them. They were, they were together. But ultimately, I would go and visit him in his little music shop in Denver, and he would receive the kids and hold them. And one time I went to visit with Mama Angie's mother, and he, he wouldn't recognize the children. She was furious. The mother, Mama Angie's mother, um, Hama, we called her, because that's how our children's uh, older birth sister called her. Grandma tried to say Grandma Hama. Hama was furious with, with Mike for not recognizing his birth kids. And uh, Mama Angie was furious with him. But he was moving on to another girlfriend, and he just didn't want her to know that he had children. Um, so we haven't heard from him since, really, except once when he moved back to Minnesota, and then we got a picture from Mama Angie that they had briefly got back together. They had a stormy relationship. Um, and then I'm thinking of, of my own spouse who, um, you know, promised when we were trying to have kids that he was going to be the equal partner. But as soon as they arrived, he couldn't. It was a physiological thing. He just couldn't be around them. They were too, it was too hard for him to retreat to his bedroom. He would just, it, and I realized it was physiological. It was just too, he was been a single, you know, not single, but he had been a very lonely, alone child, and it was hard for him to be around these crazy. We ended up a year later, Mama Angie called us and um, with a second pregnancy with Daddy Mike. So we have two children with the same birth parents and a year apart. <laughs> They're pretty crazy, right? And so that, you know, that was, that absence, once again, was very difficult because then I, had, I was the one and Steve was very um, irritable and difficult around these stresses and I had to hold that space for, for the children. And, um, but as they become a teenager, so just a few years ago, I had the younger one, we've been living separately so that I could return to Canada. I had the younger one in Saskatoon and I actually had both of them and they were both in grade nine together. We had, they had been in, living with different parents. And, and I couldn't really handle Skye anymore. And Steve came and took Skye back to Colorado. And they've been having, like Steve has been a great parent with teenagers. And um, very loving, very present for them. And it, in, I just wanted to add that I think that part of the reason he's so good is that the kind of uh, care that he got from his father when he was growing up, which was that kind of silent connection. Mm -hmm. And so I just think of these ironies, right? The ironies and the, the pain, the absences, but the kind of ironies that some of the things that may seem impossible and challenging are also become those things that become, you know, the support structure. Like right now, Steve and Sky are off on a backpacking trip. They've been doing all kinds of things together in Colorado this last couple years that Sky's been with Steve. And so I don't have all the answers. I'm probably limited from my perspective that I see things through that negative lens. At the same time, these experiences have been real. And I just wonder about, you know, fathering and f connecting in the midst of what I think of systems that kind of encourage men not to connect. Mm -hmm. Thank you for listening. I'm sorry it was a little wandering. <laughs> Thank you, John and Kai. So I'll speak for a few minutes about my dad, and then we'll wrap up. In 1951, when Jim Scales finished high school in Salmon Arm, his father asked him at breakfast, what do you intend to do? And my dad replied, I'm going to the lake. I'll hang around for a year until my best friend Doug finishes school. Harold shrugged. At supper that evening, Harold was say, said to young Jim, the Bank of Commerce is always looking for young men. You start tomorrow at nine. <laughs> and that's how my dad started his 23 year career at the bank. As the manager of the Commerce branch in Dawson City, he met Sally Slipetz, a young nurse from Saskatchewan. After a brief courtship centered on curling, beer, and travel, they married in 1961. And on Wednesday, my brother and I are gonna take his kids and we're going to Dawson City. We moved several times in the next decade until we settled in Salmon Arm in 1970, and that's where I was raised. 
In 1972, Dad left the bank, and he and Mom bought a coin laundromat, a grueling two-year experiment in small business. During those years, a steady flow of people came in for financial advice from Dad. And one of Dad's friends pointed out the truth. Jim, you hate running a laundromat, and your financial advice is much needed. So he became a financial advisor for the rest of his working life. My mom started editing a newspaper, and Dad had a business in this, under the same roof. Even after they divorced, they stayed in the same offices and provided advice to each other. My dad strongly believed in service above self. He was a member of Rotary International for 50 years, a member of the Salmon Armand District Chamber of Commerce for 30 years. He co-founded the Shushwap Community Futures and served on its board for 11 years, Shushwap Housing Society board for 22 years, and also volunteered with the Shushwap Coordinating Training Society. His father and grandfather had both been mayor of Salmon Arm, and dad was an alderman of Salmon Arm for eight years. Three qualities stood out for those of us who knew him, although all of us knew a different version of this. Dad was a reader, a careful thinker, a music lover, and a chronicler. He loved reading history, including everything Winston Churchill and Pierre Burton ever wrote. He loved classical music and opera, and used to love attending musical theater. His executors found a thick binder of theater programs from his years of bachelorhood. Dad also had wit and a sense of justice. He loved a good joke and he could break, us, break up the kids with a glance or a grin. At the symphony once, after the first movement of a piece, I was the only one in the audience to clap because <laughs> I hadn't heard the announcement that there were three parts. My dad sneered at me, shifted away and said, peasant. <laughs> and I laughed for the rest of the concert. He believed in law and rules, and especially with the rigor and clarity that he saw in the tax code. And he believed in justice. He got angry with us kids a few times for telling jokes that played on racial stereotypes. And it bothered him when rules were applied differentially to politicians and to commoners. My dad was a husband and a father and a dog lover. He was a product of his age, born in 1933. Early in his marriage, he believed that his job was to bring the paychecks home, and Sally's job was to raise the children. As soon as the children were enrolled in school, he insisted that Sally get back to work. Work, as though three kids. But they supported each other when Jim got into municipal politics and when he left Salmon Arm for weekends, spent cabin building, and he supported Mum in all her business adventures. I had a good dad. He taught us kids how to drive a nail, and ride a bike. He was the example of a man who was happy in the kitchen stirring a pot of chili or watching cheese and crackers through the oven window. He loaned money to us when the kid, we kids needed it and he sent us on trips when they, we were in our teens. He was enthusiastic about his role as grandfather to five youngsters. But most of all dad loved dogs. As a boy and then as a father he supported decisions to get family dogs. He would always be gruff about it. Well, uh, who's going to take care of that dog? And then the dog would be his. <laughs> the last dog, Buffy, was his constant companion after divorce. When I visited him shortly after, I was surprised to find out they divorced. So I went back to Salmon Arm and found that he had taken almost nothing from the house except Buffy and Buffy's leashes and dishes. When Buffy died, Dad did not speak to anyone for a week. When I asked him a year later, about this, he said, I had three kids. I only had one good dog. Perhaps I'll leave it here and introduce a meditation. This is a meditation 